<clears throat> I wonder if this is Kevin Casey. He regularly calls in. Yeah, and that reminds me, Winston, you suggested that when Priyoti is giving the presentation, because some folks will be on the phone, if there are like things on the slides that you could describe to help people who can't see the slides, that could, that could be an added bonus for those folks. Yeah, right. and we, we will share this out. A couple of our community members are visually impaired or um, can't see at all. And so describing and narrating material um, will be helpful. Yeah, so um, we do have a couple of slides that require, um, you know, there, there's some information in there and I will try my best to kind of make sure that those all get um, verbally um, described. Great. Um, but yeah, but the text wise, I think in this presentation that we're verbally explain. It's kind of hard to hear you, sorry. Yeah. Um, is this better? I think so. Yeah, okay. I realize it is this microphone that's the issue. Mm. Okay. So Stand really close. It's a lot better, but let me know if that's not the case. I'll call in. No, I think it's okay. Uh, can I ask uh, who's joining us on the phone today? Uh, Kevin Casey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and oh. clear, Kevin. Okay, great. Because apparently I was muted at first and I didn't even know it, you know, but uh, I unmuted. So, okay, great. No, happy to be aboard. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I might advise that we may uh, wait a minute or two more, see if anybody else joins, and then I'll turn it over to Paige and Priyoti. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious, Kevin, have you heard of congestion pricing before? Is uh, Very, very faintly, yeah. Uh, I heard talk about it. You know, I don't know if it's done anywhere in the country yet. Mm -hmm. I know some of the freeways, you know, have discounts, you know, the fast lanes. You know, right. if you pay extra tolls, you can go faster, but not so much the congestion. Right. So I'm interested. Great. Yeah. The, then yeah. this is exactly why we've roped the SFCTA into presenting about this. <laughs> Does it exist anywhere in the country? Not in know? the US yet. I believe New York had voters had approved it or it got, you know, the legislature approved it, but it's, uh, it exists in at least like 10 different cities across the world, like I believe Singapore um, and it, London definitely has had it for a long time. Um, oh, I see. But um, Interesting. I, imagine, yeah. I imagine Priyoti might share a bit about that. Yeah. Okay. So some information on where it cool. has been implemented and where kind of U.S. is. Oh, yeah. And you're a little bit faint again. I am faint. So I will just call in. As okay. well. I'll be sure to to let you in. Okay. And I'm wondering, Paige or Priyoti, have you all like recorded these sessions before, or uploaded them anywhere for anybody to view, or is this new territory with us doing that? We have one that's recorded and available on our website uh, at cta.org slash downtown. It's a 15-ish minute presentation um, that another one of our planners, Colin, gave. Okay. Uh, so Colin Dental Post? Mm -hmm. I know him from Geary. Yeah. Yep. So that is available online. It is a little, the one that you'll get from Priyoti today is a little more uh, recent. So it has, for example, some of some more refined policy options than we had last time around. Great. Cool. That's perfect. Uh, and even if, I mean, we have a bunch of folks who will likely be very interested. And I think. I suspect a lot of people when they hear congestion pricing, they're like, well, I don't know what that means. But when they go into the details, they'll be like, oh, actually, I have some strong questions and opinions about it. So that's perfect. Right. right. And you're saying that you will share this video yeah. with folks who missed it. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and I'll let we have a fairly active um, 
social hour, which actually Kevin regularly joins on Fridays. And I will let um, everybody in that social hour know that we've got this up and running and they can view it at their leisure and I'll pass on your contact information as well. That sounds amazing. Cool. Uh, Prioti here, I'm gonna ask you to unmute with my powers here via your phone and then maybe we could get started. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And should I give um, you, um, what do you want to call it? Should I make you co-host so that you can share your screen? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, you are now the co-host. Everybody can see my screen? I can see it just oh. fine. And it's okay. about seven after, I think we could probably get started. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so hi everyone, hi uh, Kevin Casey. I'm Priyoti Ahmed. I am a transportation planner with the San Francisco County Transportation Authority. And um, as Winston was saying earlier, we'll be giving an update on the downtown congestion pricing study. So to kick off, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that we are in a med of global pandemic and our lives have changed dramatically. And currently we are trying to make our friends and family healthy. And we realized that congestion has mostly vanished when this pandemic began. So we had to consider what that means for this study. And we don't know that exactly what a post coronavirus future will look like but the work we do here today can help us plan for the better future. And we know that the economy has been resilient on the past. So we are anticipating that as we recover, congestion will return. So the plan we make today, the, um, the work we do today can help us plan for a better future. So here in, in my screen, I'm actually showing a map of San Francisco where it shows kind of the congestion level across the city. And it is from our, um, it is from our congestion management study that we do every two years. And it's showing that majority of the congestion that is happening is um, concentrated in the downtown area and in, and in the northeastern quadrant of the city. So that is kind of the hub of a lot of congested street, as well as it is also the hub of a lot of transit services. And this is where the core transit service is located that is in the downtown northeastern quadrant of the city. Um, so when you started this study, we started looking at why people were driving more than ever. And we found that people were driving more than ever or well, not more than ever, but since 2010, because of a couple of reasons. First, there was just a growth in city's population and an increased number of jobs. So when the economy was doing well in 2019 with addition of new jobs and new population, people were making more trips. And a lot of those trips were by driving. And the other half of the increase in congestion since 2010 was due to the ride hill vehicles like Uber and Lyft which increased the number of car trips. So those are the main reasons why we are seeing so much why we were seeing so much congestion in 2019. And we also know that congestion affects everyone. Too many cars on the road delay people who are trying to get home or to work or to medical appointments. We know congestion uh, pollutes air, uh, pollutes the air as well as the car trips. Um, increase of car trips also increases the frequency of car related crashes. Congestion also affects, disproportionately affects low income communities and communities of color disproportionately because this, these communities are more likely to ride on the bus, which is stuck in traffic, live in areas where higher uh, rate of traffic collision happen 
have health impacts like asthma from polluted air. Also, it spends a disproportionate amount of transportation, disproportionate amount of their income on transportation, especially those who drive. So here I'm showing a map of San Francisco, and it shows um, the areas where the communities and communities of color are concentrated. So those are the areas in downtown, in Bayview, in southern part of the city. And I'm also showing where the most collision happen in the city. So these are the streets where we have recorded a higher number of severe and fatal collisions um, in, in that last couple of years. And those areas are primarily located in downtown and Soma neighborhood, as well as in the mission. So those are kind of the high dense for both of these issues. One is the communities of color and communities of um, low income communities where they're located, and they're the one who's experiencing the higher rate of traffic collision. So that's what the graph is showing, that collision is impacting this community at a disproportionate rate than the other communities in the city. And we have tried to fix this congestion pro problem previously. Um, the initiatives, there are multiple initiatives that city has implemented, and these include deploying traffic officers to control and manage traffic, better managing street parking to reduce circling, and encourage more uh, space efficient travel with transit only protected bike lanes and a ride hill to an attack on ride hill trips. These initiatives helped, but they weren't enough. And we can build our way out of this problem because there's just so much demand for driving and not enough road space. And I'm showing uh, an image here on Mission Street where there are all modes of transportation are, are happening. So there are a lot of cars, there's a bus, there are people walking, there are people in the sidewalk. So it's a very vibrant, a vibrant picture and what you can't see that with so many cars blocking the transit lane the bus in this picture can actually move even though there's a transit lane in this picture so too much congestion is affecting everyone and especially the transit riders who are riding the bus because there's a transit lane and it could get somewhere faster but with congestion it just can't move so the bus stop is so the bus lane is not working as well as it could. So when our economy rebounds and congestion start reaching its unacceptable levels again, we need to reduce car trips to downtown to make walking, biking, and transit improvement work. And as we think about how to create a better transportation system post-pandemic. Let's keep in mind strategies that can get people to shift from cars to other, so other space efficient and sustainable ways to get around. And that's where incentives come in. And now we're exploring this idea called downtown congestion pricing. We are exploring this idea, um, and this means that um, we, uh, that traveler could pay a uh, Fee, a charging fee to drive downtown during weekday rush hour, and uh, others could um, and and through the fee, others could change their travel behavior to take transit, or walking, or biking, and this yeah, this um, you know change of demand and shifting of modes could keep the traffic moving. These this fee structure could help incentivize. Uh, travelers to switch other modes so we have better road space for all modes of transportation. So when traffic returns, um, this idea could reduce the number of car trips going downtown at peak times. And as Winston was mentioning, as um, Kevin, you were mentioning before that, yes, this idea has been implemented around the world and no U.S. cities have been implemented this idea before but New York was the first city to approve a congestion pricing program. So they yet have to implement it, but they did approve this um, in the New York City. So I have, so we have two cities that we would highlight. The first one is London. 
Um, so London launched their program in 20, 2003. And with the introduction of this program, they also increased transit services and they saw substantial benefit when it came to reducing congestion, increasing transit ridership, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The second city is Stockholm, and they launched their program in 2006, and they saw similar benefits as London um, that includes reduction of traffic congestion, increase of transit ridership, and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And um, an interesting fact about their program is that when they introduced this program, two-thirds of their residents opposed it. So they implemented as a pilot to see how people were react and what would the behavior changes be. And after the pilot was over, they took another vote and found that two-thirds of the residents actually voted in favor of making this program permanent. So the, uh, so the travelers and the residents of this um, program actually saw substantial benefit to keep this program, uh, to make this program permanent. And here in San Francisco, we actually studied this program uh, in 2010. So we uh, looked at what congestion pricing could look like for San Francisco in 2010 and found that uh, a program like this could provide significant benefits such as reducing traffic congestion during peak times, reducing vehicle delay, and improving transit speed. And we also found this idea could also reduce greenhouse gas emission, reduce traffic collision, and the business effects were broadly mutual. So um, given these benefits that the 2010 study found, many planning efforts have recommended congestion pricing as a policy tool, including San Francisco Long Range Transportation Plan, Vision Zero Action Strategy, and Climate Action Strategy. For these reasons and many more, uh, as congestion worsened in 2019, our board, the Board of Supervisors, asked our agency to explore how such an idea could work for San Francisco. So we started by, so as we took on this um, study, we first started looking at data of who was traveling into northeastern part of San Francisco when congestion was at its peak and found that 75% of drivers in Northeast are trips coming from within the city, rest from around the region, which is the rest 25%. So these are the trips, the, so we found that majority of the trips are coming from within the city um, that are traveling to downtown. Uh, so we also looked at who was traveling downtown during morning rush hour by di different income groups. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a graph here and it shows um, different travel behavior by different income groups. And what we found that high income folks uh, were more likely to travel to downtown during morning peak and they were more likely to drive than take transit. And only 13% of the morning the travelers were low income drivers. So we, so these are the people who would be most interested in uh, protecting from an equity perspective. And um, when congestion, and we found that, um, you know, in San Francisco, when congestion was at its worst, we saw a lot of congestion downtown, buses stuck in traffic and cars blocking crosswalks. And in the future with this program, the idea is some people could pay a fee to drive downtown while others could choose to drive at a different time or travel by a different mode. And everybody has a, you know, a smoother ride as they choose their mode of transportation. And certain groups like travelers with low income or disabilities could receive an exemption or discount. And fees from this program could be reinvested in things like better streets and better transit. Um, to achieve the benefits that other cities saw from congestion pricing, we estimate that we need to reduce rush hour car trips by at least 15%. And that's, that's our target. And if we reach um, our 15% target, we expect that would be enough to meet the four key goals of a congestion pricing program. 
Um, the first goal is getting traffic moving would allow people and goods to get where they need to go, especially we are talking about reducing the amount of traffic delay and speeding up buses while maintaining the same amount of people going downtown. Uh, number two is increased safety for people that are walking, biking, and driving and taking transit. And this would be by uh, reducing number of uh, crashes and injuries downtown. Um, the third goal is to clean the air to support public health and fight climate change. Um, this would be achieved by reducing um, greenhouse gas emission and other unhealthy air pollutants. And the fourth goal is advanced equity by protecting low-income folks from cost increases with debt discounts and exemptions and prioritizing program improvements for low-income communities and communities of color. And um, our study team is doing some initial analysis um, to see um, how we would meet this goal. The congestion pricing zone that is under consideration is in northeastern part of San Francisco, including downtown and Soma neighborhood. And this map shows a potential boundary designed to include the most congested areas and freeway ramps while being easy to understand. These boundaries are flexible and uh, we're interested to hear your feedback. Currently, uh, uh, so we have studied various scenarios of how this program may work. And of the scenario analyzed so far, one good option is an inbox configuration in which driver would pay a fee to drive downtown during morning, during rush hours that morning and evening. And under this scenario, vehicles would not be charged when they exit the congestion pricing zone. To accommodate people that are taking transit, this option would include a 20 to 25 percent more transit services in downtown. Another option still under, under consideration would be drivers pay a reduced fee that would be charged in both directions, both inbound and outbound. So that would be a bi-directional fee structure. To make sure that program is equitable and does not um, increased costs for low-income travelers, we have also looked at some income-based discount options. The best performing one so far is, um, is a fee exemption for very low-income drivers and a 50% discount for low-income drivers. Um, and this would be achieved with a fee of $12 to dive into, to drive into congestion pricing zone during rush hours. So, uh, I'm showing um, a graph here, and it's showing that um, there are two options. One is the moderate discount, which is um, $10 fee with 50% discount for low-income drivers, and a very 50 and 50% 50 discount for very low-income driver discount, as well as discount for people with disabilities. And the other option is showing. Um, $12 fee for moderate and high income, and a $50 uh, and a 50% discount for low-income drivers and a 100% discount for very low-income drivers and with discounts for people with disabilities. Um, and we have found that the 50 and 100% discounts would be the most um, equitable one as well as the best performing one in the technical analysis. There are other potential discounts that we are also analyzing right now. These include discounts for zone resident drivers, discount for um, bridge toll pairs, and a daily fee for people that are going in and out of the congestion pricing zone multiple times a day, as well as transit discounts. So the current schedule for our project is that we started the study mid-2019, and we have done some initial analysis. We have done one initial listening session um, later last year and early this year. And here we are really defining what this program, the main ideas could look like. And we are reaching out to you and others to hear your feedback. So as we will take your feedback and do another round of technical analysis while we will 
we we find some of the scenario options that I shared today. We'll come back early next year with some more uh, information on this uh, idea and seek your feedback. And our idea and our goal is to present the recommendation to our board of supervisor by mid next year. And just to give a little bit of the road, uh, road ahead for this program that if our board next year approves us and says to go ahead, we would need to get a state legislation to able to implement this program. And if we get that, we will need to do detailed policy and system design to make sure how will this program work, what are some of the very nitty gritty um, you know, um, idea and path forward from this goal. And throughout this all process, there will be a lot of community outreach. Um, so uh, we are here to hear your feedback. Also, I have some uh, uh, some ideas of how you can get engaged and keep being engaged. We have, you can email us with your feedback. You can play our game that is online. Um, you can sign up for text message um, to receive um, to receive updates and to play the survey um, and uh, sign up for any email updates. And uh, here's a little bit more information on the game. The game is sfcq.org slash fog city. Uh, and here you can design your own congestion pricing program and learn about the discounts and investment and the subsidies. Or if you can also text us um, uh, with, the, with the keyword traffic to 415-449-4214 and uh, do, this, uh, do this game um, to a text survey as well. With that, I'm open for any questions. I have a question, Kevin Casey here. Hi, Kevin. Hi, I'm wondering about Uber and Lyft in the city and what effect they have with the congestion. Have any studies been done by how many of these cars are roaming around during the day, taking up yeah. all the parking? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Think, uh, so our agency, uh, Transportation County, uh, San Francisco County Transportation Authority, did a study on looking at what is the Uber and Lyft um, effect on congestion in the city, and we found that 50% of added congestion was from the TMCs, which is Uber and Lyft. So as we are studying this program, we are very aware that this service um, added congestion in our city, and there are need to be some you know special um, special thought process that needs to go to determine what type of policy would make sense to um, you know uh, what type of pricing policy would make sense to discourage them or do you know to properly price them um, as um, as other drivers because other drivers are commuters and their pattern is completely different they come to downtown park their car go to work and then go home well Uber and Lyft you know, can go to downtown, pick up passengers, drive around, come back. You know, they have a multiple, they can have a multiple leg um, trip. So we are thinking about those, um, you know, that, uh, that, that industry and that travel behavior because they're different from a typical commuter. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. And that 50%, that's huge, 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that, that they do and when they're waiting for calls to to pick up people is they're taking up parking places mm -hmm. <laughs> which yeah. is another problem you know uh that's i think the biggest factor that's going to have to be worked on i don't know the the answer but that's horrible yeah yeah i mean we are we'll come back in um in um late this year early next year and we'll have some you know kind of uh draft ideas of like what how may we may want to address their uh travel behavior because as you said they are you know and they can take up parking spots and can just roam around um so it's it, yeah 
Um, is there uh, any limit to how many Uber and Lyft cars can be in use during different parts of the day, or is it unlimited at this point in time? I believe it's unlimited. I don't think they, there are any uh, restriction or regulation on how Uber, how many cars Uber and Lyft can operate. Yeah, this is this is Winston. I can actually speak to this a little bit just because of the work I did in my grad grad program. So mm -hmm. an important note is San Francisco cannot directly regulate Uber and Lyft and uh, services like that. We can regulate taxis, um, but Uber and Lyft are not legally considered for the moment taxis. Um, and so the same state agency that regulates uh, PG&E uh, regulates Uber and Lyft and they haven't set, um, they have some regulations, but they haven't set like a limit on how many there can operate in a certain area or where an Uber or Lyft can start from and end to because um, people have expressed concerns about, oh, is someone driving from San Diego or Sacramento to drive around all day in SF? Um, they they come over from the East Bay. I've heard. I think I don't know how their system works personally. Maybe Priyoti knows more. But, but you know, individuals, individual Lyft drivers or Uber drivers come over from the East Bay to get business in the city. I've heard from a driver. Sure. Uh, um, but is the agency the PUC? Is that the state agency? That's correct. That, the California Public Utilities Commission. So they have some authority uh, to do something or? Yes, though uh, there have been in the past several years, you know, sort of disputes between San Francisco's transportation agencies, I believe, including the SFCTA and the CPUC, where, you know, the city attorney and the MTA and CTA say, hey, if you all aren't going to like take more actions regulating Uber and Lyft, can you let us have permission to do that? And then CPC will say, no, you don't have permission to do that. So there, there's a bit of a, been a longstanding battle between those different parties in San Francisco, I don't think is the only uh, city in the state of California that's had the same struggle. Yeah, there's one uh, subtle, maybe it's a subtle benefit because I've talked to a couple of people that had cars that live in San Francisco and mostly stay in San Francisco have given up their cars, mm -hmm. sold them because Uber and Lyft is so instantly convenient. And they just hit the, the app on their phone and the car is there within minutes. So they've given up their personal cars. Uh, I don't know what that number is, but maybe some people, you know, have done because they don't want to deal with the parking, you know, and all that. They just mm -hmm. would rather take Uber or Lyft. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Yeah. So that's, that's that's all. And I was gonna ask Priyoti a question of you about congestion pricing. How would this pricing affect like if I was driving a bus for the YMCA youth program into downtown SF or um, for paratransit, which is I know a, a public program how and taxis how would it affect uh, or be structured for uh, modes like that so um, any shuttle or any anything public uh, you know publicly offered it would be exempt so you wouldn't have to pay a fee um, and uh, taxis would just pay the fee as a regular regular person at this point like twelve dollar you know that that would just be part of it um, but if you, if you are driving a shuttle or um, have, um, you know, this private shuttle companies or um, um, you know, a city uh, authorized vehicle that are like operates as a shuttle, it would be exempt. Okay. So even if I was driving, say for the YMCA, which is nonprofit, but a private business, and I was driving a, you know, 20 passenger bus into downtown SF, <laughs> that vehicle would not be subject to the fee okay right because the whole idea is that you're not driving you're already making a better decision and you know it's it, it, yeah it's, it's a it, it's not a critical that it has to be like a transit like mm. sfmta 
know, it, it. It, it just sounds that you're choosing a sustainable mode. So if you're carrying more than a couple of people, you're, I mean, you're really trying to discourage the one person <laughs> in one car or one or two people yep. in one car. Um, yeah. Can you talk logistically a bit how this would work? Like I drive into, you know, past Laguna or whatever line it starts at. How yeah. do you all? all know that I am driving a bus versus my car and how do I get billed? Like, how would that work? Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, in those cases, uh, there are a couple of ways uh, we can do it. There are times that you can get a non cab fast track. So one way we will charge or we can charge everybody is through the tolling facility where that will grab your uh, transponder information like they do in Bay Bridge or Golden Gate Bridge, like th that. So we can provide uh, a fast track that is kind of a dummy that it will grab your information and will say, okay, this person is, ex is exempt because they have a shuttle. Um, and like Muni buses and whatnot, that they are already, you know, they already know that, you know, that would be, um, that doesn't even have to have a fast track. So that could be one way to do it. One other way could do it that you pay and then you get reimbursed for it. You, sh you show that, oh, you are driving um, some type of a authorized vehicle and then you get exempt. So there, there are a couple of ways to operationalize, oper operationalize this. But um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's how it could work in theory that we have different tags for, um, you know, uh, shuttle system that we can say, okay, these numbers of tolls would not be charged. It will grab it and say you're exempt. Got it. Um, I have some other questions, but I wanted to see if Kevin, you had other comments or questions that you wanted to share. Not, not at this. No, go ahead, Winston. I'm, I'm not at this time. I'm just okay. taking it all in. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I, I guess my follow up question on that, uh, Priyati, is um, like, how would the reimbursement work? Like, if I'm like, hey, I got billed for this and, you know, it shows up in my mm -hmm. mail or something. Would I have to do that every time? Or would it be like, mm -hmm. oh, no, Winston is driving a bus for the YMCA. He's submitted this reimbursement once. The next time we see that vehicle or whatever it is, we're yeah. not going to make him fill out this paperwork every time. Right. I, I think that makes most sense. Like, administratively, that is most efficient for you and for us that, you know, if we already know, like, okay, these are the vehicles we know drive, they're privately owned, they're shuttles, they will drive X amount of time. In terms of reimbursement, we can just set that system up. Um, and I, there's also been times that, you know, uh, instead of every time, it all sometimes can um, get billed. So every instead of every time you pass, you can say like, okay, I don't want it to pay every time. We can pay like 30 times and then get reimbursed. So it can we can operationalize it as we go along. Um, but yeah, the 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 shuttles will be exempt. Uh, Kevin here, wouldn't it be easier to just pre-register the vehicle as exempt? I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, pre-register. So you all are still working out the nitty gritty mm -hmm. administrative details that Kevin yeah. and I are asking about. Yeah. So we are really looking for that, um, you know, first is the idea kind of makes sense. Like what are your feelings about it? Second, uh, we are looking at the two options that the charge may happen. One is the inbound where a driver would pay just going into the zone and not when they come back. And that uh, the proposed fee is between 10 to $12. And that would be depending on the discount level, which is 50% for low income and 100% for very low income. Um, so those are, the, those are the one option we have. And the other one is a bi-directional. So your fee would be a little less. You can think of it maybe um, half, maybe a little bit less, more than half, sometimes somewhere between um, 6 to $7 but you would pay it both ways. So you would pay once to get in the zone and you would pay when you leave. So um, to kind of get an idea of, you know, the idea in general, does it make sense? Do you think it will be useful to San Francisco? And then what are some thoughts on this, um, you know, initial design aspect of this? And then, you know, the, the, the 
the operation part, the monitoring part, the, the privacy part, those are all to follow. And we are very aware that this is very important for um, the success of this program. Got it. I was curious, you mentioned earlier, you know, discounts for low and very low income. What income levels does that mean? Like, you know, how much would someone be earning to be considered very low income uh, versus low income versus you pay the full fee? Yeah, so um, so I have some notes in here and um, I, I um, Paige can also help me out. Um, so the income levels we have, this is for a household of four. So the very low income would be for a household of four would be 55,000. So if it's household of three, two, one, it's only less um, than 65. So that one way to think. And then the low income for household of four would be 65 to 95,000. So um, if you're a household of three, two, one, it will only be less than 65 to 95,000. So those are the two income groups, and the moderate um, is 95 to 142, middle from 142 to 165, and then high is above 50, 165. And that's all for a family of four, like you said. That's all for a family of four, correct. Got it. Okay. Um, and then was there going to be a different level of discount for individuals with disabilities, and what would be their process? for verifying that you know they qualify or have a disability. I think about that because a lot of our clients do have disabilities and have to complain regularly about how much administrative paperwork they have to go through. Yeah, I, I mean, I would actually be very interested talking to you about what are some ideas you have that we can do because we are thinking this and we are mm -hmm. finding really um, like offer to say, you know, we want to avoid that paperwork, you know, we want to avoid that, oh, I need proof or like, you know, whatever the, the amount of work they're already doing. So is, are there existing programs we can look into that say, okay, these folks we already know are eligible um, from disability and they will achieve certain discounts. So we are working on that discount and um, I, most likely they would be exempt, but, you know, um, I can give that formal, um, point when we come back later, but there there will be a substantial discount mm -hmm. for people with disabilities, most likely be exempt. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm curious to know what uh, what programs we can look into. I mean, the one we know is the parking um, mm -hmm. platform set. Um, and, you know, there are some issues with that. We, we know. So, wh so I mean, that that's something we will definitely look into and already have started thinking about it. Um, yeah, but what other ideas do you have that are programs we can look into to kind of link them together to say eligible for one, automatically eligible for another one? I had a few, but I'm going to defer to Kevin first to see if he had any thoughts. Yeah, I, I did think of another question. Uh, does congestion pricing have to be approved by the people, the voters, or can the Board of Supervisors just invoke it? or? Yeah, so uh, the congestion pricing, our board would first need to approve it. Um, and, you know, our uh, this process will go through a public uh, process. So you will be, you know, you can come to the board, which is publicly held and, you know, give your um, give your input in that way. And then this study will need to go to a state authorization. So no, no public road today can be charged. So they need to be free. So if we want to charge public road or a zone, we need to get state authorization. So that will need to happen once our board approves this. But yes, our board would be the body to move this forward. So it wouldn't be a, a ballot issue for those the voters to vote on. It would not. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Um. Thank you. To answer some of your question, Priyoti, I'm, I'm thinking about people who qualify for SSI. Um, God, I'm embarrassed. I'm forgetting the full name of what it stands for. Um, but it's often for uh, lower income, older adults and adults with disabilities. Um, and it's like supplemental mm -hmm. income. Um, that's a program that I might suggest looking into to, to link. Um, there's also, 
I might advise hitting up the Golden Gate Regional Center. And they coordinate a lot of um, services and referrals for adults and people with disabilities in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. So they would have some good ideas and you know, I would then also just talk to, to paratransit because I know some people who even ride paratransit from other counties have like a, a special card. Um, and so that that's a program that would be useful. Um, and then I don't know if it conforms with your, your income guidelines, the, the free uni for, for seniors program, or how mm -hmm. that aligns with your income guidelines. But like if someone's already enrolled in that, and gone through the paperwork, that might be an easy, easy box to check of saying, oh, yep, you, you're an older adult and you qualify for this income level, so. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Yeah, that, that is very helpful. We, um, we know that, uh, you know, any discounts for them that we're gonna come up with, we don't want to make it more work for people to get this benefit. We are trying to link them with like, lifeline or other you know socially um or other benefits that um the state provides so these are these will be helpful to talk to folks from these areas to see how can we link these two ideas together yeah and i, I imagine have you talked at all with the department of disability and aging services and the um, mayor's office on disability i'm sure yeah we have with them a little bit and they have flagged it that we need to you know um, we do need to link it um, and I and yeah and I think they also have some ideas on how to do that so yeah we are we are talking to uh, mayor's office of disability um, and um, also the SDA that we have hmm. in it, so. okay the other one other body I might suggest and and I'm going to completely, that answers all my questions or comments, uh, is have you talked with anyone at CASE, Coalition of Agencies Serving the Elderly? I can make an e-introduction, but they're like a monthly meeting of a ton of the city agencies that provide services for uh, older adults and adults with disabilities. Winston, that's a new group that I haven't noticed is on mm. our list come by me yet. So um, it would be great if you get if you could give us an e introduction. I'll do that. Yeah, Greg Moore, who is works at uh, God, I forget the name of it. Uh, in the Tenderloin, there's an agency in the Tenderloin that he works for. Um, mm -hmm. He's the co chair of Case, and I'll do an e introduction for you all. And I'm sure those folks would very much like to hear about this and and weigh in. Okay. Uh, great. And then I'll, I'll step uh, back and Kevin, I don't know if you had any other thoughts on this program or I did something just popped up in my mind and I don't even know. I'm not sure, you know, if this has any connection or anything to do with it or, or at all, but I'm just going to throw it out there. And uh, to explain it would be the um, added tolls for the diamond lanes on freeways at certain times of rush hour they just charge your clipper card. So I was wondering if the clipper card that people have could be useful at all as far as charging or finding out that they're exempt or, mm. you know, the clipper card has a lot of connections, but whatever, maybe it's totally not a good idea. I don't know. I personally no, think no. it's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a, a pretty good idea. So I uh, could you tell me more about this uh, clipper card? Because clipper card uses is used in transit, all transit in Bay Area, and I wasn't aware that you can pay toll with the clip, clipper card. So well, the, yeah, they have a uh, uh, fast track. Fast I might track, be thinking right. of that too. Fast track fast is charged. Track. Fast track is charged, but okay. so I guess I actually, I guess I meant to say more about fast track, but Clipper card has a lot of connections for transportation, mm -hmm. you know, public yep. transportation. Uh, I, that's why I say I, I, I don't know if, if it would be considered at all, but it just has a lot of connections. So I wonder, yeah. if, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead, go ahead. 
I, I mean, you got me thinking, Kevin, like I'm wondering, I've been familiar with some of the talks about like agencies uh, needing to link better, but like, I'm wondering if people could link their fast track and Clipper accounts somehow in the future and that could be integrated in part of the system. So you don't have to create yet another login and profile and billing <laughs> thing. Cause right. it's just like right. A, right. a nightmare, even for me. And I'm, I feel like I'm pretty savvy at that stuff. No, cause Clipper card is very convenient. Yeah. Golden Gate Transit, Muni, BART. Caltrain. The, yeah, all of them. You just, you just um, tap your Clipper card. You know, it's very conveniently linked to a lot of things in transportation, but I don't know if it would work like that. You know, it's, I don't know. No, I'd be curious, maybe Priyati, you can speak more to this because in London, their Oyster or Ostracard or whatever, I mean, you can just, I think, load cash on to use it for a bunch of other purposes. It's a lot more functional even than our Bay Area Clipper. So ha has that uh, been integrated into yeah. London's congestion pricing at all? Um, so London congestion pricing doesn't have that. They, what they do, they actually read your license and send you a bill at home at like after, after a month. So you pay like a utility bill in a way. Um, by London Oyster card, you're absolutely right. You can load cash and you can do a lot of stuff. You can buy a lot of retail. Like if you're a tourist in the area and don't have, you know, the appropriate debit card or, you know, credit card, you can use your Oyster card to purchase things. You can pay for their bike share um, with, with, your, with their Oyster card, which you can do it here as well. So you can do a multiple things. And I love the idea of integrating fast track with Clipper. And it is because that way we know how people are traveling, you know, throughout, like some, not all people drive all the time. Not all people take transit all the time. So we can say like, okay, like you took really great transit for like most of the month, you can get a toll for that grocery run that you have to make or a senior parent that you have to take to hospital or like, you know, for that off time that you just have to drive, you transit option just doesn't make sense. And that, that way we can link those two together. And at, at the same time, it would be like awesome not to have to sign up for yet another program, yet not to pay yet another bill. And you can kind of like, keep all of that like transportation cash or transportation, you know, budget under one umbrella, which that may be Clipper or Fast Track or whatever. But the sad to say is that they're not integrated. They're both a very old system. So, um, you know, our, our world has moved forward at a faster rate than I think a lot of people had imagined. So like transportation is taking a different look and both of the system, wasn't envisioned to kind of be under one. One was like transit, transit, transit. Other one was toll drive, toll drive. So now that we are kind of thinking of that, hey, either you're taking transit or driving, you are under the same universe. And we want you to make decision appropriately to make this thing smoother, you know? We have constraints on how much we have and then all the demands we are getting. So it would be awesome if these two systems could talk. Unfortunately, not yet, but I know there's a lot of regional interest of making these two systems kind of integrate. Um, so yeah, this input is really useful because, um, and I'm, I'm so actually like excited that you guys are coming up with this idea because these, this is, uh, you know, really, really exciting that uh, you're already thinking of some like, not just paying a fee, but how can make this be easier to, you know, easier on you. For sure. Congratulations, Kevin. You're going to help revolutionize our Bay Area transit <laughs> billing know. system. <laughs> oh, you too. You too. I mean, anything that will limit the paperwork or the bureaucracy or, you know, it just, it's, it's very discouraging to have to deal with even more and more and more, you know, it should be less and less and less if you can, you know, consolidate. And that's what Whatever. technology is supposed to enable for us, right? We're supposed to have more, the tech's supposed to mean we have more time and things are easier, not more papers to fill out or emails to respond right. to. Right, right. So something has to be done, especially Uber and Lyft. I mean, I think 50%, they've caused a big problem in this small town. 
with a million people or whatever. There's something, I don't know. I don't know the solution, but it's a problem. Kevin, did you have any opinions or thoughts on, on the presentation or the, the ideas behind congestion pricing itself? Like any initial, like, I, I like this, I'm nervous about this, I don't like it, anything like well, that to share? I think initially, like anyone, I mean, it depends on your brackets, but uh, I guess I want to say that I'm not really in favor of charging people more mm -hmm. money, but, but something like Uber or Lyft, they have to be regulated like the cabs or something, uh, you know, some type of regulation uh, because of the problems they're causing. Uh, it's, it's uh, number one, there is a problem because they take the parking places and there's more cars, too many cars. And it has to be, has to be dealt with in the best way possible. I don't know if uh, limiting, probably limiting the number, I guess, of some, try limiting some of these cars. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, well, uh, you know, there's all kinds of like people talk about free transportation, make Muni completely free completely somehow you know have the city pay for it it sounds pretty extreme but that would get people out of their cars i think i don't know so uh, uber lyft currently do pay a tax on ride hail um it, i think it was passed last year last year i think um so it's a ride hail tax on uber and lyft so that one way i think city is trying to but that was during pre-pandemic and you know their their behavior i mean the number of uber and lyft has shrank in the city and um, so yeah I noted that you know they are a problem and parking is an issue they're taking out parking spaces and you know that's confusing for everybody in this scenario and um, you know city might be losing, losing parking revenue um, and uh, yeah, and our study uh, is looking into their behavior specifically to see how can we encourage them not to, you know, drive around or discourage um, their mode. Yeah, I mean, I just thought of another thing. There are sometimes necessary trips. Suppose you have to bring your car downtown for repair, or, you know, there's a doctor, a whole bunch of things. There, there's a whole bunch of times when you need to make a necessary trip, not just to go shop mm -hmm. to buy a pair of shoes or something, but you got to bring your car downtown for something. And now what Correct. you're going to be charged $12 to do that. I'm against it. Yeah. Keep in mind that $12 is during weekday morning rush hours. So that is like three hours in the morning and then three hours in the afternoon. And the rest of the time is free and weekend is free. So, um, we are just looking in, looking at this, like when the most congestion happens and how can we best reduce it. Also, this program would be free, free for people with low income and a 50% discount for low income and a complete discount for very low income drivers. Um, so yeah, the, 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 you'll find to point those two out. Yeah, so you can schedule an hour when it's not rush yeah. hour. That is yeah. one option. That's good. That's an option. Yeah, that's that's that that helps. That yeah. helps. One other thing I was curious as well. I almost forgot to ask. You said you were considering in tandem with doing this, increasing transit service by what twenty ish percent in the downtown area as like a hey, we're you're not just getting a charge we're also improving the transit service. How would you determine which lines specifically yeah. to increase and how much and, and where would the money for that come from? Yeah, so uh, what, um, so you're absolutely right. The motivation behind this is that, okay, you are gonna have to switch because you don't want to pay for your, you know, trip and you want to take transit. So we, out, so we have a model, which is a travel demand model. Basically what the model does it looks at the existing travel behavior of people like today, what are pre-pandemic, what I was doing, not me, but like a person with my socioeconomic background where I live, given the transportation options I have, it can determine what choices I would make. And that's basically based on the time saving, right? Time saving and cost. Uh, 
I'm choosing option that will get me somewhere faster and cheaper. Those are the kind of the way that they're determining where you would go. So the, this model uh, we can put that, okay, if, if we have a pricing in this, how people will travel and the 15% discount and the 15% goal to reduce traffic. So when we reduce the traffic 15%, how are these people traveling? Some people might change the time. Some people might go to transit. And then we're looking at, well, if people go to transit, where they're going and coming from, which districts, which uh, neighborhoods, and based on that, which route do those neighborhoods are served? Like, is it Mission or um, I live in Portola? Is it Portola? Is it Richmond? Which of those neighborhoods would now need expanded transit services, perhaps the new route, perhaps long, better frequency? Because those neighborhoods people now would switch transit because it's cheaper and they can get somewhere faster or faster or cheaper, right? Like that is the choice people are usually making. Um, so that's how we would determine that route and the level um, because we are because we have something of the sort of a travel demand model that can predict these um, behavior changes. Got it. So you've got the the software and the and the data that basically says, well, it's roughly we know or expect that when we do this, we will see an increased demand on these bus lines, and because of that, we're going to increase service on those bus and rail lines. Cool. Yep. That's okay. exactly how about this. Got it. Thank you uh, for helping explain. I wasn't sure if it was just going to be like throw all more buses on all of the bus lines. Um, so cool. All right. Well, that's all the stuff that I was curious about. Kevin, do you have anything, anything else? No, I know. No, no, no. It's been a lot. It's very interesting. A lot of stuff to think about, yeah. but just fundamentally, basically there is a problem and it's got to be dealt with. One yeah. way or the other, there have to be some changes. But I think, I think, yeah. I hope everybody's in agreement with that. <laughs> 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 there is a problem with congestion and traffic and everything else. If, if they're not, I, I don't know where they're at. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I um, mean, you know, during COVID and at night to drive when nobody's around, it's like, hey, this, <laughs> this isn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, we've all experienced it, right? Hey, there's no traffic. This is cool. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, too bad it can't be like that. But that's whatever. Yeah. Okay, Paige, Priyadi, anything else you want to share with us or, or should we call it a, uh, it a day? Just thank you for having us. And we will have a second round of outreach that we'll be doing in uh, the spring. So we look forward to uh, connecting again with some updated uh, policy options that we've uh, come to with both community outreach and our uh, continued modeling. So. Uh, you'll be hearing from us again. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. I'll sign off. Thank you. Bye.